power of incentives. Super interesting. I'm on the phone with, uh, I'm going to call them out. We did get internet now, but Frontier, uh, which is an internet provider out here in California, I imagine in a couple places. And I didn't notice it at first, but after the second or third time, a representative on the phone said, uh, by the way, there's going to be a rating and it's just for me. It's just for me. So if you could let, you know, how I did, not mm-hmm. anything else. And what, what happened was that every person was super friendly, told me that things were being fixed, told me that in 24 hours, don't worry, we fixed it. It's going to yeah, be yeah. up. And I was on the phone for hours and hours on end and it was never fixed. It never came up. Finally, a technician came out and I didn't let him leave until I did a speed test mm-hmm. <laughs> that confirmed Uh and I just realized that the incentive structure that has been devised by whatever corporate people trying to make good stuff happen is you're, you're going to be rated individually. You're going to be rated immediately after the phone call. And this person does not know who you are and will never be able to track you down again. Right. So you can't the, get to the yeah, same yeah, yeah. person. So the incentive say, hey, structure promised be super friendly. Don't fix anything. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and promise that it's all going to be good and that you found the problem and it's going to kick on any minute now, probably within 24 hours. And the and by the I got hit to the 24 hour thing after the second time it happened. And I was like, "No, no, no. You need to send a technician out here so I can like yeah. physically hold him." No, I just I think often the uh it sucks and you want to try to do it kindly, but the number one thing that motivates companies it seems is I'm going to switch. Mm-hmm. So if you're having a phone problem or an internet problem and you're just, you act like your only option in the world is Verizon or T-Mobile mm-hmm. and you're trying to work with them, often so little gets done until you go, hey, if this isn't fixed in 24 hours, I'm just going to switch. Mm-hmm. And then miraculously, it doesn't fix everything, but all of a sudden you're getting better service, yeah, yeah. quicker service, whatever it is. And it's to your point of the incentives, if you're on a subscription, it's not like you pay Spectrum or, or Frontier more yeah. or less depending on how good they do. So until you flag that you're going to switch, they're getting their paycheck every month either way. Well, it's just interesting how the stickiness of the business model naturally evolves into this kind of service Mm -hmm. for these types of things that are like, look, it's going to be a tremendous headache to switch accounts and it's going to be a big headache at the end of it, but mostly you just chill and they get to ding you for a commodity service that costs the same exact price for somebody else who probably has the same issues, (laughs) you know, and it's like airlines, you know what I mean? What are you going to do? We're the only people that fly direct to LA. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Like, (laughs) No, the other thing that's interesting with subscriptions in particular is sometimes there is a, like, instead of offering a better service, you just lower the price a little and hope no one mm-hmm. even recognizes that you're charging them. This is a bit of a pivot, and I won't name names, but we met people at a conference recently where their business models basically don't provide much, but only charge $2 a month mm-hmm. with the idea that if you can just get people to sign up, they'll stay forever. They mm-hmm. might not even remember that they pay for you. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's that, that weird gym, gym model, basically, of get someone in on a contract that they can't cancel and then... Just, just ding them without providing any value. Yeah. Well, the, I guess what I was, as I was thinking, I was like, how do you get people not to do this? Like, how do I get this guy who I will never find, who is at a call? He's not even at a call center because it's COVID. He's just hanging out at his house mm-hmm. to care. And I was like, the only, just made me see the value of something like religion and ideology in general, which is the, I think that people in the absence of some sort of ideology, whether it's a strong moral code that their parents beat into them, which is often religious, patriotism, one of the big isms, basically, will find a way to make any sort of incentive system not serve its intended purpose, right? The intended purpose of, I imagine, what you the, the frontier incentive system was to get people to make customers happy, so they're going to rate them at the end of it. And I think it's just a natural thing that people will find <laughs> the shortcut there, which is be super polite, get them off the phone, mm-hmm. get a 10 out of 10 rating. Um, well, this is the whole philosophy behind that book that you really like about reinventing organizations is mm-hmm. that if you, if you silo people and segment them and you give them tasks, but you don't tell them what it's for, mm-hmm. it's kind of exactly like in Game of Thrones when that guy tries to chase the mountain because he's told to wait somewhere, but not told why. Yeah. So people will try to do what you tell them, but if they don't know why they're doing it, inevitably they will not do what you had hoped they would do with the mm-hmm. incentive structure. Mm-hmm. Although I think with, in the case of Frontier, they might be happy to just give you the runaround. Even as a business, yeah. No, that's, that's a... And I think something that we've seen is that 
even even in our businesses, it, incentives have the same outcome, mm-hmm. which is like they're they're crude motivating tools. Sometimes, in, like they do transform action. Let's put it that way. Like incentives are incredibly effective at just redirecting resources and activity to other places. They're not super fine tuned, yeah. <laughs> and they don't get. They're not holistic mm-hmm. in in how they work. And what has been, I think. What has been the most holistic thing? It's, I guess it's like a religion or being an owner or having your name on something. That's something else that we saw was like, hey, we want to make sure that everybody is, uh, feels that, that their name is somewhere written on this thing that they've built. And that then creates a more holistic approach to yeah. No, I try every, every couple of videos I try at the end to shout out the editors yeah. by name. Mm-hmm. It just, just get, it gets them to put their photos on it. And I think yeah. it makes them feel happier to mm-hmm. to work on it i think because yeah. they know that they're gonna be acknowledged for it well it's acknowledged and i mean i feel like when i'm when i make these videos it's okay what's the if i were making these videos for someone else what is the bar that this has to hit mm. okay now it has my name on it yeah, yeah. what is the bar that this has to hit totally different totally yeah. different and at least you're the og man i gotta yeah. make I, my bar is like <laughs> are people gonna bitch that this wasn't made by charlie <laughs> so i've i'm constantly just like all right i gotta give it another run oh, through dude, i mean they they complained about stuff when i was doing it too the, well i'm fine now i've been doing yeah. it for almost a year yeah. but at first you know video four now everybody's either figured out it's gonna be me forever or, we'll never or they still think, yeah, exactly <laughs> everyone either goes charlie's gone forever or Charlie never left. That's what every Cruise on Command person thinks. Are you sick still? <laughs> There's another thing I, I did. It's It only works for some uh, people. And I know I know that people are really against tipping. In, or not against tipping. They think tipping is a crude model in the waitress, waiter, food industry. But I found with the movers, at least, these guys are coming in. The company that runs the website is taking, I think, over half the pay, even though these guys are doing the labor. Mm -hmm. And so when they were moving, I was, I said, Hey, I don't have cash. Can you just text me your Venmo so I can tip you at the end? Mm -hmm. And that's all I said, but I just kind of made it clear that there was more money in it for them. And I think that that's a helpful thing you can sometimes do is flag early instead of if I just hadn't said anything and then gave them a tip at the end, Mm -hmm. I feel like that would have been still a pleasant surprise, but it might not incentivize them to care as much. Yeah. yeah. Whereas when I said, hey, just shoot me your Venmo, I'm going to tip you at the end of this just so you get it instead of the corporation. Mm-hmm. They were super appreciative. And I think that made them feel less shitty, I guess, about doing hard labor when someone else was getting most of the money. Yeah, I think the, we- yeah, tipping is weird because then it becomes habit. And it's like, I, I tip well and I tip the same amount no matter what you do, <laughs> you know what I mean? I just build it into my mental framework of the cost of, of things, at least at restaurants and that sort of stuff. So I wonder if that's, it's, it's power is worn out. But no, I, I agree with the movers, man. Those who worked hard and were carrying boxes all damn day. That would be no fun. Hope that you guys enjoyed that clip. If you want to see more like this and have us do more podcasts, we are 100% funded by our generous patrons. And if you'd like to contribute, there's a link in the description and we'll have one pop up on the screen right here so that we can do more podcasts where we have fun conversations and hopefully some deep ones like this. Either way, hope that you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.